name is Deborah Thomas, and I am the R. Jean Brownlee Professor of Anthropology and the Director of the Center for Experimental Ethnography here at the University of Pennsylvania. I want to welcome you to this evening's lecture towards an acoustomology of Afro-Cuban rap by Pablo Herrera Veitia. And uh, this evening's program is hosted by the Center for Africana Studies, and we've co-sponsored it with the Center for Experimental Ethnography and Latin American and Latinx Studies program. It is my great pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker. Pablo Herrera Villitia is currently a PhD candidate in social anthropology at the University of St. Andrews, UK arguably Cuba's most influential beat maker and the pioneer of the Afro-Cuban and Cuban hip hop sounds. His research follows the question, what is it like to be Afro-Cuban in Havana today? And what can urban Afro-Cuban music tell us about citizenship and how it's expressed in both public and domestic settings? Herrera Beitia was the recipient of a 2018-2019 Nasir Jones Fellowship at the Hip Hop Archive and Research Institute at the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard University. Hearing Afro-Cuban Rap, which is the archival project he began there, treats golden era Afro-Cuban songs, rap songs in particular, as ethnographies that most meaningfully articulate the counter narratives that drove the racial debate into Cuba's public sphere between 1995 and 2004. His written work has appeared in Cuba's Revista Casa de las Americas, Metronome's Documenta 12 magazine's issue, and more recently on okafrica.com, where he has developed part of their profile on Afro-Cuban urban music and culture. Herrera Beitia has collaborated on several major academic research projects on rap and reggaeton music in Havana, including Sujata Fernandez's Cuba Represent and Close to the Edge, Tanya Saunders' Cuban Underground Hip Hop, Mark Perry's Negro Soy Yo, and Jeff Baker's Buena Vista in the Club. To his credit as a cultural producer goes the coordination of the Black August Collective Showcases in Havana, which is a series of US Cuba people to people music events. Black August brought to Havana's International Rap, Rap Festival presentations by Mostef and Talukali's Black Star, High Tech, Dead Prez, Common, Tony Touch, and Project Blow between 1998 and 2002. And he was also instrumental in the Roots concert in Havana, among other projects. We will now turn the floor over to Pablo for his lecture. And following the lecture, we'll have a little bit of time uh, for some Q&A. So feel free to type your questions in the question and answer box at any time during the lecture, and I will voice them during the Q&A. So please join me now in welcoming Pablo Herrera de Itia. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you so much. That's that's wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you for that. Um, so um, so usually in these presentations, I, I would like to um, share my screen briefly here to see if I can open my, uh, which is operate with sound as well, um, and just to just to make sure that I go um, to the the beginning of this presentation. Um, what I what I kind of wanted to to do here today is uh, talk about this particular artifact that I've been working on and this kind of artifacts that I that I create um, to produce and present my 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 ethnography right. So I uh, I would like to thank Professor uh, Professor Deborah Thomas, director of the Center for um, Experiment, Experimental Ethnography, for the opportunity to give this lecture in collaboration with the Center for Africana Studies and the Latin American and Latinx Studies Program at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm also particularly thankful to Gail Garrison and Tia Campbell of the Center for Africana Studies for supporting and helping coordinate the back end of this presentation. I'm also very fortunate that Jim Sykes, uh, Professor Jim Sykes, pointed out the existence of the center. To me, I didn't know about it um, until very recently, and I was very impressed and fascinated with the work of the center after watching uh, the Fall Fellows uh, event with Stephen Phil presented um, um, uh, 
um, hearing heat. Um, I was actually trying to figure out an icebreaker, you know, people just make people feel comfortable before you start a presentation, but somehow this, me, me talking about finding uh, the accurate um, icebreaker is sort of my, my icebreaker in some way. So what I'm going to do before do this, before I start is sort of present this idea of how this lecture is going to go down. And, and I want to say that the main audience that I try to target through my research work is the people um, who are part of my community in Havana. And uh, there are some you know, issues of particular debates that may resonate in my, in my discussion that I hope that we can talk about um, uh, towards the end of the, of, the, of the lecture when we go into the Q&A itself. Uh, but just to begin itself directly, I wanted to uh, say that um, there will be some moments when you see black screen. This is the fir first black screen, but it's actually part of the text that I will present. But then the other black screens you see later on are basically a uh, you know, video that I will be playing um, that, that goes into black screen. It's nothing, there's no malfunction whatsoever. But um, the way for me to start is basically by introducing uh, my, my participation and my, my practice as an Afro-Cuban um, um, uh, Santero and uh, FI divination initiated priest as well. And I do so to talk about and, and, and frame the work that I do and this lecture itself within the context of Afro Cuban Santeria and Afro Cuban FI divination as a way to theorize what I'm, what I'm working with. And then later on, be able to mention the work of you know, other people that I work with and the other works that I, that I read. But in particular, um, if I divination, I, I, as some people may know, or people who are maybe in the audience, if I divination is, uh, is, um, works through an oracle that uses 16 uh, uh, major figures and their 20, 256 permutations to uh, you know, uh, create a commentary on, re on reality, uh, particularly on the past, the present, and the future, and solve solutions to a particular prophecy that we drive, the prophecies that we drive from understanding and reading and interpreting this Odu, which actually is a name in Yoruba. Um, so in, in Ifa divination, Odu, uh, the oracular uh, figure, Okana Sode explains the birth of the ears as a human organ. And similarly, the birth of the human, of human, of the human virtue of hearing. It is actually on, in the Odu, in the oracular figure, Ejiobbe, where Ifa prescribes that a priest of divination must first listen, then interpret, then analyze, and finally apply what has been learned. This, and this, this is a reference that I got in personal communication with uh, Babalao, a Cuban Babalao who lives in, in, the, in, South, in Southern England named Jorge Gallo. Um, with with this introduction and, and this sort of a, a special sort of aura of you know if I, I want to sort of go now move into my presentation per se. The description that I sent um, uh, 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 to introduce this this talk that I was going to give today I'm going to give today starts to question what is the nature of Afro Cuban rap music. Afro Cuban rap music is inherently transgressive. That's the answer. However, I believe that my answer requires the presentation of some context. And for that purpose, I've, defi I've divided this presentation into three parts. It'll be a brief presentation of the theme of my doctoral research and what motivated me to embark in it, an introduction of my methodology, and a presentation of towards and acoustomology of Afro-Cuban rap, which based on the fact that, that we're kind of short on time, I'm gonna cut it, I'm gonna give you the go straight into the presentation itself. So the working title of my dissertation is Havana's a Noise and, and Rhythm, Understanding Afro-Cubaneity. I'm a born and raised Negro Habanero. See if I can uh, make this smaller. I'm a born and raised Negro Habanero, a, a black man from Havana, an Afro-Cuban. I grew up in, a, in the neighborhood of Santa Suarez, right at the geographic center of the city of Havana. The claim to be Afro-Cuban seems self-evident to me, but what is Afro-Cubaneity? The question is, uh, this question is at the heart of my research project. And it departed from my lived experience as a black man with several initiations in Afro-Cuban Santeria and the Father Nation. It departed from my experience as a black listener, my work as an Afro-Cuban rap music producer, and my participation in several academic book projects 
that attempted to make sense of Cuban society during the advent of Afro-Cuban rap and the fall of its overt treatment of Cuban racial politics through music, specifically between 1995 and 2004. Book examples that I refer to mostly in chronological order are, like uh, Professor Deborah Thomas said, uh, Sujata Fernandez's um, Cuba Represent, which is a masterful ethnographic account on how the Cuban government reproduces its power by co-opting any oppositional ideologies coming from Cuba's cultural sphere. Then there's the 2011 John Baker, uh, Jeff Baker's Buena Vista in the Club, an in-depth ethnomusicological study of the tension between Afro-Cuban rap, racial politics, and Cuban reggaeton politics of dancing. And we can go into that later. Then there's also Tanya Saunders, uh, Cuban underground hip hop, the powerful uh, sociological examination on the Cuban hip hop underground movement and why it needs to be understood as, as part of this transnational challenge to the larger structure of coloniality in the Americas. And next and finally will be uh, Mark Perry's book, Soy, Negro Soy Yo, which is a meticulous ethnographic account on what are the first visible effects of Cuba's transition from socialism to Cuba's present ambivalent relationship with neoliberalism and, and how they've basically affected um, Afro-Cuban racialized citizenship. Now, by the time I embarked in this project of academic research, there were also several, um, a, a, a plethora of academic and newspaper articles and, and books and documentaries that had also been produced within Cuba itself. And I'm, I'm, I'm showing pictures of the magazine Movimiento here to represent that, you know, the, that particular literature, the literature that was dedicated to, to hip hop culture in Cuba. But obviously that we can talk about the work of Tomás Fernández Robaina, we can talk about the work of Martin de Betancourt, we can to, to talk about the work of Yesenia Acelier and many others who, who've done, you know, groundbreaking work on, Afro, on black life in Cuba. But, um, um, the main issue is that while those sources outside and, and inside Cuba cover a, a range of details about Cuban hip hop culture, I felt that like the questions that I attempted to articulate through my practice and the questions I was asking my reality were not clearly answered in any of them. So specifically, there were two arguments that I made that, that made me rethink my experience uh, with Afro-Cuban rap in Havana. The first one was Jack Satali's assertion that music is prophecy, it makes audible the new world that will gradually become visible, that will impose itself and regulate the order of things. It is not only the image of things, but the transcending of the everyday, the herald of the future. And then there was David Scott's, see if I can move this thing. There was David Scott's compelling um, argument that almost everywhere, anti-colonial um, uh, uh, utopias have gradually weathered into post-colonial nightmares. I think the main question that, 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 that I derived from Atali's work was this question of, you know, what does Afro-Cuban music mean uh, or is, is saying about the, the, key, the future of Cuban society, right? And then based on, 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 uh, on David Scott's question, I was, I was wondering, what, what does our urban music say about the future of uh, Afro-Cuban life in Havana itself? So this basically, these are the questions that are basically at the heart of, of um, of, of my research. So the, the, these are the, there are, these arguments prompted me to develop an interest in understanding the future of, Cuba, of Cuban society and specifically the future of African Cuban life in Havana. So with these questions, and I'm, I'm repeating this one, I decided to embark on this journey of inserting my, my insider voice in the debate on present day Cuban reality, not to explore answers to the question, what is it like to be black? Uh, sorry, uh, basically to explore answers to the question, what is it like to be black in Havana today through a study of the audible character of Afro-Cuban life and, relationship, and its relationship to Afro-Cuban citizenship in our curiosity milieu. The question, what is it like to be Afro-Cuban, what is it like to be black in, 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 in Cuba today, is molded around Sylvia Winters, what is it like to be black, which he framed after uh, um, uh, Thomas Nagel. This idea, you know, in, in, you know discussing the sociogenic principle I, what I'm trying to do in Cuba is basically how, how do I recalibrate the idea of what it is to be Black and the category Afro-Cuban based in or after the, the, the emergence of new uh, Afro-Cuban post-socialist um, um, uh, subjectivities, right? How do we, you know, update the idea of the, of the question of what it is to be Afro-Cuban today or the category Afro-Cuban based on this new, the emergence of, you know, post-hip-hop, 
uh, or reggaeton or, or, or you know, post-socialist uh, um, Soviet activities in Cuba, specifically just this idea of how we've become um, more Afro-diasporic in so many ways and not as much um, uh, new men and new women. No, now, um, in this direction, I'm interested in the ways the, the category Afro-Cuban describes a sonic manner of being and doing. That is, whether the way we're Black and our performance of Blackness is shared in the sonic presence of our music in public and private settings across the city of Havana. What I'm trying to achieve is a description of the character of the city, of, 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 my, of my community's uh, collective memory of itself and sound, specifically within the sonorous dimension of Havana's life world which is what Tim Ingold has described as the weather. And I believe that, you know, the weather as idea is a departure from Mary Schaefer's notion of the soundscape. And I use it better because I think the weather in itself is a more efficient description of our quotidian immersed experience in sound within Havana and other Cuban uh, cities. Perhaps another way to describe the weather itself is what Julian Enriquez has described as, um, open quote, the gaseous medium of air through which sound propagates, end of quotes. My questions about the social significance of amplified urban music across Havana could also be articulated through what Enriquez himself has suggested is a social cultural wave band. In other words, the vibes by which music makes itself, uh, makes sense uh, and is valued by those who listen to it. And now this is my first example. It's, a, it's an example of the weather of Santiago de Cuba. So we can see that the weather is not exactly a blank canvas here. It never is. This is, this is a sample of a moment. This is like two o'clock in the morning or four o'clock in the morning in Santiago de Cuba. But the case that I have studied in Havana is somewhat different. Uh, though there are some aspects of Jamaican sound system culture that are practiced locally. I'm more interested in the ways permanent and or temporary sonic takeover of pedestrian spaces takes place in places like Havana and Santiago, and in how they may signal citizen, citizen, citizen estate exchanges. <clears throat> um, um, and since exchange exchanges, you know, the sonic, uh, the idea of sonic takeover is an adaptation of, of Umi Bohan's maroon environments, or what Brandon Labelle urges is the scripting of space through acoustic politics in sonic territories. But applied to our Afro-Cuban capacity to distinguish the sonic ubiquity, particularly or particularly Afro-Cuban sounds across Savannah. And this is my next example. We can see that basically that now we see the weather, but then now infused with this, this sounds of this Afro-Cuban sounds that we, I'm talking that we can identify as Afro-Cuban directly, particularly drum ceremony music. So making sense of music, uh, by, you know, making sense of my, my, this making sense of music by my, my knowing through sound resonates with also with, with Tina Camp, and this is a suggestion uh, from the work, um, uh, uh, Thomas as well, uh, but how, Tina Camp has described after Matthew Morrison, the type of impression that frequencies leave on us. 
But then Tina Camp is actually referring to visual frequencies. I'm, I'm referring to sonic frequencies and not only to the impression they leave on us, but also to the relations we, we reproduce through our experience of such frequencies. There's a bit of theoretical flight here, but bear with me. What I'm actually talking about here is the social cultural relations we reproduce through our discrete and loud playback and listening practicing practices, and which connect to what Wehelie has, you know, Wehelie's argument that music is transmitted through different, sorry, uh, that music as it is transmitted through uh, different sound technologies provides alternative spaces for the articulation of diasporic citizenship. And this is my next example. Right. So, so here, but in, in particular, this idea of an Afro of, a, of an Afro diasporic citizenship, a diasporic citizenship that is, is you know, is connected to what we, Alexander Wehelie talks about, uh, here is sort of contrapuntal to, to the you know the Afro Cuban new men and new women subjectivities that were produced, uh, actually were meant to be produced by Cuban socialism. And I, but I, I think that this is it, it happens in this countries where you know, you know, the, the, these two uh, kinds of um, subjectivities, these energies, if you if you will, sort of work uh, or happen and co you know, sort of coexist and merge one with the other, um, in, in 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 the space of Havana, as I have experienced it. So I argue that the presence of these fleeting and permanent spaces of sonic spaces, sonic stages of Afro-Cuban. Uh, urban music represents uh, racial and territorial anxieties in connection to the geographical inexistence of a piece of land we can call our own. And the conscious or unconscious mapping, scripting is also a good word here, of the of a sonic territory I hypothetically call Afro-Cuba. Obviously, Afro-Cuba has been, as many, many, many Cuban intellectuals who have talked about, discussed the idea of Afro-Cuba. But I mean, I, I'm actually really interested in how Robin Moore, for example, has discussed briefly how in the 1930s, the Workers' uh, Confederation of Cuba considered the creation of a black territory that would comprise some of the island's eastern municipalities. That would be basically Santiago de Cuba, sort of the area of Cuba that's closest to the Caribbean in some way. And, uh, but, but, but mainly this idea, this discussion of sonic territory is, is, is I, I have actually found it following David Crouch's argument after Marco J that a nation's anxieties about its identity are essentially about space. My point here is that the, the Afro-Cuban claim for space or to space continues to be exerted or has continued to be exerted through Afro-Cuban raps amplification politics as we should see during the presentation of towards an acoustomology of Afro-Cuban rap, the annotated playlist. My argument on anxieties about space land or land dispossession as they appear here are conversant with other arguments about hip hop and territoriality, for example. They evoke, for example, the work of Trisha Rose and how she has placed uh, 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 the post-industrial city as the context that birthed hip hop earliest innovators. Or Mary Foreman's implications of hip hop spatial logics and the hood as an arena of experience. And also Kenneth French's notion of topo musica, and as well you know, uh, uh, polarizing regionalisms like East Coast, West Coast, or Dirty South. All of them point out to the importance that we as uh, as diasporic citizens play a place in finding ourselves unified in a land that we can call our own. My supervisor, Hugo Muardo, in, in, in describing this, this this sonic territory that we're trying to propose, that somehow we, if we were to think about it, the sonic territory that we're sort of building and you know in mapping in sound or scripting in sound, this you know these questions may be pointing here. So, what kind of society is being created in the process of scripting an Afro-Cuban territory and sound, and what sort of territory and what sort of Afro-Cuban futurity are we producing through? Um, through you know through through the, the, this inscripting in sound right, um, this is kind of the end of the of the framework, uh, the, the beginning of our present of, of our presentation. This 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 sort of framework of my my my, my doctoral thesis. So I wanted to sort of introduce you you to some of the questions that I'm dealing with in my dissertation, and then go move on to discussing my methodology as well. Um, 
Uh, in this introduction of my methodology, I what I what I what I want to consider are the multimodal aspects of my methodology, right? So here, what I call methodology, rather than a push reflection on on how the methods that I have used help me get to the answers I have begun to accumulate, it is an accumulation of the means I have decided to use to disseminate those answers. I always find it fascinating when others uh, quote uh, Jack Satali's work uh, on the political economy of music, which is so fun foundational to the field of sound studies. Uh, Enriquez himself uh, has um, uh, used, uh, has actually quoted Atali's contention that the world is not, uh, is, is not for the beholding, the world is for hearing. It is not legible, but audible. It's as a way to introduce his orientation of thinking through sound. I'm actually interested in Atali's suggestion that it is sounds and their arrangements that shape societies. That's actually what, what interests me. And then from that, then I go into understanding what Ifa says about, you know, how sound, how, you know, how we, we use sound to understand our realities and, and describe what we do. As a Black listener, what I hear and the way I hear uh, is defined by my experience as a Black person, but, but mainly by my practice as an Afro-Cuban rap music producer. So my encounter with Atali's and, and Enriquez's work was also a way to ground in theory what I what I call my auditory encounter. I, I actually I, I've gone into this idea of the auditory encounter after listening to uh, Professor John L. Jackson uh, explaining his inroads into filmmaking and how using a camera provided ways to understand how we cannot see and seeing in ways we're not able to see before. He was actually referring to the work of Walter Benjamin's discussion of the optical encounter. I make a reference to my auditory encounter to signify my use of microphones, not specifically how sampling, which is another discussion, how sampling to make beats make me discover the sonorous dimension of Havana, which is another discussion, but rather how listening to the city through microphones gave me a loose sense of the shape of Havana's sonorous dimension. It's really Afro-Cuban, the Afro-Cuban sonorous dimension, or the Afro-Cuban, uh, sorry, the, the sonorous dimension of Afro-Cuban life. Following Kofi Agawu, I use microphones to create sounded field notes that give me access to another angle of what, of that hole which is only accessible or could be actually reproduced in the ethnographer's fictional text. Beyond the fact that editing could also be construed as a way to fictionalize the narratives of what we encounter through fieldwork. I believe, you know, microphones, for me, microphones beat the pencil, but that's just me. So this is a, just an example that I want to play about this this particular issue of this 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 encounter that I had, and this basically is a d display of me listening to sounding, making field notes within the public space and or in a public space and also in the private. So basically, it starts with the private space and also with a public a public encounter in a car, a car driving from Luyano to the center of the city of Havana.
So this will be this might be the point to highlight the importance of an Afro-Cuban manner of producing and delivering anthropology, what, what Shana Almeida has described as a race-based epistemology. In other words, to stress what kind why why my kind of anthropology tells an important story. My positioning in this perspective started with the question: how do I, an Afro-Cuban man from Havana, a rap music producer, how do I become an anthropologist? Potential answers to that question could begin with an interpretation of what Mark Campbell and Mary Fairman, after Mary Fairman, has described as rapping, representing. My Afro-Cuban uh, uh, special poeticism and historicism within the disciplinary plantation logics of anthropology, where my account as an insider may not amount to much more than a mere native informant playing at being an anthropologist. This interpretation of hip hop's representing is at the center of my multimodal work. But there is a bit also a bit of uh, a play in my relationship with the ways to with, with the ways to theorize thinking through sound that are not strictly Afro Cuban. For example, as you may have seen in the beginning of the lecture, you know, I used the I used the word acoustemology, I used uh, Stephen Phil's acoustemology, which is why he has advanced as the uh, at the agency of knowing the world through sound. Now, growing up in, in, in Cuba, in socialist Cuba, uh, and this is a continuation of this description of my methodology. Growing up in Cuba, I was inspired by the visual aesthetics and the urgency of Santiago Alvarez cinema, but also by the lower third embedding of metadata in early American rap videos. So this is a wrap. This is basically a brief account of what my methodology is, and we can discuss that later. Now, in terms of towards an Afro-Cuban of Afro-Cuban rap, the annotated playlist, uh, which is the is just my the latest, especially the latest version of these artifacts that I have been producing uh, uh, for a while now. Uh, and it's basically the type of di digital environments or artifacts that I produce to represent the way I hear Afro-Cuban uh, rap uh, poeticism and historicist arch in, in Havana, in Santiago de Cuba, our, our island's largest areas. My discussion of poeticism, and this is a reference to earlier, and historicism are a nod to Padre Henry's work in Cal uh, Caliban's Reason. Uh, and my intention is to situate this this conversation uh, in my analysis in, in, of what happens in Cuba within a clear Caribbean perspective. Per se, and I'm I'm just going to present basically uh, there were you know for uh, for towards the acoustology of Afro Cuban rap was uh, was a particular uh, um, a piece that I presented at EASA 2020 uh, last year in Lisbon. And there were basically two main notes that I read, but I, well, I rather than reading the two notes for the purpose of time, I'm just going to focus on just basically the the themes of them, and then read part of the the opening statement of, of the panel itself. The first note basically was about how Cuban socialism has yet to address the issue of racism. That's the main statement, and then basically the proposition of a format of an Afro-Cuban anthropology, which is so. I think is something that I think is still in the works, uh, but it's, it's basically something that interests me and that I think about a lot. The actual uh, opening statement to the panel said, uh, it's actually called Relistening to Transgressive Music, Acoustemologies in and from a Changing Caribbean. The panel was a, a continuation of an ongoing discussion on address on understanding the use of sound and music as ethnographic methodologies and as a means to present knowledge. The broad concern is with the relationship between sound and power. What are the conditions under which a sound piece is, rec is recognized as an object of power? When does music levy social forces? How is sound a political act? We suggest that, uh, and this we is basically, it's a text that was pr pr produced basically by Professor Carlo Cubero of University of Tallinn. Who, uh, with whom I work and have been organizing uh, panels uh, on sound um, for the last five years. Um, and we basically we convene this. So we, say, we suggest the Caribbean and Caribbean descent that music presents itself in, in complete ethnographic forms as a challenge to written ethnographic production in and from the Caribbean. 
we are interested in examining the ways in which music symbolizes ideology, encourages political action, and is constitutive of power relations. The Caribbean is dominated by raciological discourses and the continuation of imperialist policies, grassroots expressions of, of, pop of popular music carry an inherent transgressive potential. We ask how is the music of the abject subject? When does it circulate? What does it, what does incomplete citizen, citizenry sound like? And how can it, can it not be transgressive? In this sense, the panel itself presented examples of transgressive music in, Sting, in Kingston, uh, Jamaica and San Juan, Puerto Rico, London, um, the, U the UK, and Havana, Cuba. And I think the overall point of of the of the of of my presentation was basically to present uh, the my this this playlist as a way to to create an introduction um, to uh, of ethnography that wasn't just me sitting there reading a particular text. And uh, the last note basically made a reference to. Um, the last note made a reference to um, um, this idea of the question said, what, you know, what would a sounded anthropology be or what would happen if we began to consider seriously, you know, sound recordings in themselves as meaningful forms. And this is obviously uh, a reference to some samples and at, at, at all the, the article uh, towards the sounded anthropology and not just as sources of data to assist our writing. Following Gavin Stango and Jim Sykes and Ana Maria Ochoa, I'm also using this format to perform my personal Afro-Cuban decolonized mode of thinking and listening through sound. I'm also using this format to present my way of making sense in sound. And this is the, 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 the playlist itself now. Anonimo Consejo, Revolución, ha. Anonimo Consejo, Revolución, yo, yo soy Melico Quino. Revolución, no me la aprietes más, que yo sigo aquí. No me la aprietes más, déjame vivir. Por mi Cuba lo doy todo, soy feliz. Y, y tú sigues sí reprendido en mí, suéltame a mí. No me la aprietes más, que yo sigo aquí. No me la aprietes más, déjame vivir. Por mi Cuba lo doy todo, soy feliz. Y tú sigues sí reprendido sigue. en mí, suéltame a mí. Con la arena que pisas dos pasos más y se te recuerda que estás en era divisa. Para ver todo no es como lo pintan y yo sigo aquí, aquí. de frente a los problemas, ah. aguantando con mi mano el hierro caliente, sin pasarme por la mente, coger una base y probar suerte en otro orilla. A 90 millas, todo no es como lo pintan y yo sigo aquí. aquí. Cada paso en la calle es una preocupación, extranjero en busca de comunicación con la población. Cinco minutos de conversación, policía en acción sin explicación. Andando para la estación, trabajes o no trabajes, ellos. ellos no pueden creer que estés hablando de cualquier otra cosa que no sea de negocio. De madre socio. Principales cínicos nacionales e internacionales han de contar con mis descomunales verbales. Burbujeo, flow en manantiales, dará los pedales que te cogen y tú sabes, tú sabes. Tú sabes, caso grave, suave y no cabe, duro pa' que no se crabe, quién sabe no se intromete, así se empina de el micro como paseo del maquete se empinó, lucha por Cuba, lucha por Eva, y hazlo cubano, urbano, mal hermano, porque esto es, es la ciudad que tú te vas por encima, tú eres así, que tú te vas por encima. Sandunguera, que tú te vas por encima. Tú eres así, que tú te vas por encima. Yo, 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 y
hiere, me hiere y me pongo sentimental. Me aflijo, me aflijo. Me aflijo porque mucho talento, un barrio, demasiado. Yo, yo admiro a la gente sola, en serio, porque la gente lo. Esta es la raya que me hace como Cuba ahora se llena de compañeros con el trabajo que pasa con esa gente. Para llegar a un villano. Y ahora Cuba, compadre, yo te lo digo así, yo el día de, si yo me ayudo a un mano, y yo la reviento, cuando a mí vengan a hacerme entrevistas, yo, yo, a mí no me van a poner a entrevistar, porque yo, yo sí la voy a echar con ellos, yo si no, 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 a poner el pie, no, 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 Vino este hombre aquí, pam, pam, y yo me fui y hice esto y esto y esto. Porque en Santiago de Cuba la gente, pam, 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 los artistas los discriminan, el bim, pam, y hacen, han, 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 han hecho estrategias para, 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 para desaparecer el movimiento de hipó. Ah, no, no, me, no, yo a mí, a mí no me voy a poder entrevistar. <risa> no, de verdad, de verdad que no. A lo bueno, pasan los tiempos, yo sigo viendo mis flaconas hoy. Oye, oye eso, ¿no? Thank you, Pablo, for such a rich and really integrated um, 
presentation. Sorry for the sirens in the background. That's um, fine. <laughs> Um, we have a little bit of time for questions, and I want to remind people to write their questions in the Q&A, um, and I will pass them along. But to get things started, um, I really like the notion of sonic territory. And what, yeah. I, what I hear you saying and what I am hearing in the music as well um, is that um, an exploration through sound is showing you and showing us through you how Cuban society is becoming more, this is this is what you said earlier, more Afro-diasporic yes. than the new man, new woman of Che, right? Of the vision of, of Che. Right. And I want yeah. to hear you talk a little bit more about that. You reference it at the very end right, with the idea that socialism is going to obliterate all of the other divisions within society. But I wonder if you could say more about how you see this sonic shift connecting Cubans more with different Afro-diasporic populations, and then what you think could happen out of that to change the notions of, of sovereignty um, right. that we're sort of used to. Right, so, so obviously there, I think, the, the first the first thing that happened there was my encounter with the work of David Crouch. And, and I thought, well, if 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 this is the, this issue of like this anxiety is about territories and about I mean obviously it all departs from from uh, Gilroy's uh, you know uh, sort of arg in this argument that we we are in the diaspora at a point of no return, right? So we're in Cuba if you stand Afro Cubans, you know, my, my grandfather bought tickets to jump into the Black Star to go back to Africa. But ultimately, we are we you know his family live in Cuba. I had lived in Cuba. We we did not you know obviously uh, as some sort of you know intellectual project today. Well, I may be interested in going to Nigeria, Algeria, etc. But my family we live in Cuba. But so so the issue that I've uh, found here, particularly, is issue is like how is it that we we grapple with the fact that we don't have a territory that's out, that we can call Afro-Cuban, right? That we can call ourselves Afro-Cuban. That we can. Can can understand like what exactly uh, is is our place, and and I think that many of the anxieties that I'm talking about have to do with this issue of how we present this loudness, and you know this is there's like massive issues of you know the amount of complaints for and fines the police fines people for uh, sonic indiscipline in, in Havana, right, and across Cuba as well. Specifically with the you know reissue of you know the issue of you know this, this sort of portable technologies etc. But the main issue here is this conversation that 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 uh, this introduction to this idea of foreign territories that's also established through where Heli is work is in in how like what I presented how 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 uh, listening to music this this way to these technologies that are ultimately not produced within Cuba or they're not consumed in, or produced within Cuba how we are entering spaces. There are basically, you know, you know, post-national or, or, you know, transnational in some way. And obviously here, there's another conversation specifically about how Tanya Saunders has positioned this idea that our practice of hip hop has allowed us an entrance or a protocol, what I call it, a protocol into, you know, a, a challenge to the the larger discussion, the larger challenge to the structure of coloniality within, within the 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 the, the hemisphere. Um, I think the I think the issue uh, uh, with with the, the sonic territory is something that's quite important because how I, I think there's a there's a demand that's being that's being repeated since the beginning of, of you know since the triumph of, of the of the not the revolution but the actual independence wars uh, which in many ways you know we're, we're trying to find out ways in which we could feel that we we found. Um, uh, the way, whether we had achieved social inclusion, right? If I'm if I'm gonna be in this society in some way, what I'm trying to say is that if if we if we're gonna be part of Cuban society, is there any way in which we could be left alone, and we can close the door and be somewhere where we can just discuss ourselves and have it? You know, right now what we know is that in, in many ways a lot of the you know this is quite debatable and problematic uh, for a discussion. Uh, it's also a provocation. A lot of the, a lot of the, the actual uh, revolution in Cuba has been an agrarian revolution, and so agrarian reforms 
and, and urban reform have never really planted or continued this idea that Blacks and Black lives should be granted a space for itself. Mm -hmm. So where, where Blacks don't actually have that space to create, you know, uh, you know, a sense of their own, how do they manifest it? Yeah, yeah. And if we, if we start thinking about it, then it's like, well, I mean, is it, but, but I think the main question here is, is this something that's conscious or is it unconscious, right? But I think I think the point that you know Umi Mohan makes about this this issue of you know playing drums creates a particular maroon environment where we are. This uh, this is the kind of environment. So and so in some way in some way there's there's, there's a temporality to it. There's also a, a permanency. A, a, so there's some ways in which this 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 spaces are permanent. Someone lives in a, in in a building and they play live music since they have a new say the new ipad with the latest sort of equipment they blast their music from the porch and that's it you have to live with that <laughs> so 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 in the sense that i think I, I think i'm going in this practice of uh, this afro-cuban practice of good character mm -hmm. that if I, the father of nation prescribes is how is it that we continue to be to 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 make our future yeah. right to the, to think about our society and the space that we need when it is yeah. not given yeah, yeah. right yeah yeah, and so it's a claiming of that territory of the sonic space. It's, which not, it's not even, a, it's a, a taking over. It's a taking, it's a taking over. over. Yeah. Yeah. So there are a couple other questions and I'm, I'm quite conscious of, of the time. So I want to read out the questions and you can choose uh, how you want to answer. There's one simple question that I can just give to you now um, and you can give a, a quick answer. Is there a way to listen to this playlist online? And um, I can, I, this playlist is not online. This is basically for academic purposes. So I don't really circulate it. Um, I think you, I think I can, I think you have it already, Deborah. So if other students want to use it, they can have access to it. And, and you know, obviously email me. Um, I'm going to, I can put my email in the chat later or give it to, uh, to Sean Fields. And then maybe that can be circulated to students who will want to ask me questions directly. Um, but that's, that's okay. Okay, and then let me give you these two. Dixon Lee has asked, has written, I'm so intrigued by the ways that prophecy sets off a different relationship between voice, temporality, and writing. Mm. And uh, they would like you to speak a little bit more about how the re-sensorialized binding of speech and language to an epistemology of Afro-Cuban Blackness interfaces mm. with Sylvia Winters. Uh, right, right. Sense of man. That's one. And let me give you another. And I'll give you a little time to answer before we conclude the event. Um, would you, this is Jairo Moreno, mm. would you draw a space where music gives way to sound? Uh, and, and he's writing the question of legibility uh, Atali Dixit is inseparable from questions of intelligibility. Yes. Music and sound hold different or at least discernible differences with respect to intelligibility. So to whom music and or sound should be intelligible in order mm. to carry out what kind of political labor, right? So that's a question really about audience, legible to whom, what kind right. of politics is it well, for particular exactly. audiences? Exactly. So that mean to, to start first with the idea of prophecy, that question that the student addictionally uh, put, you know, posed. I think the I think the main idea is how is it that I think what what I'm doing here, and this is a, perhaps a way to answer also the question that Heidel is is presenting. It's like if we you know what's happening now in in Havana and people who travel to Cuba could see is that in you know where where this this. Lots of the lots of the ideas that I have about this black territory or about black about intelligibility or how is this conscious or not come from the practice of ifa divination and the 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 surge of initiates in ifa divination that there, there mm -hmm. are in Cuba at the moment. So, for example, I am wearing a bracelet that I don't know if you can see there. The bracelet is like this. This bracelet represents that I have been initiated in ifa divination. I have a degree. I'm actually a, a, a priest myself, but this place that represents that initiation. If you look at the if, if you look at the way of Cuba, and if you go to Havana, and you walk around Havana, you see how many many people using a bracelet like this one or one that's green and yellow, right? In two thousand and one, a friend of mine said, asked me, 
Pablo, would you imagine a society where everyone would know, would have their, 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 that, their, their initiation in, in divination, where everyone would know uh, their purpose in life? What kind of society would that be, right? So, so, so the framing of prophecy as, as, as the beginning of the theorizing of understanding sound, interpreting it, analyzing it, and then understanding what it means and applying that knowledge comes from this practice that in some ways untold, but everyone in Havana, most people in Havana, if you go to Havana in Cuba in some way, you see this French citizenship, fringe, so a French citizenship, that where lots of people again are, are using this these necklaces. What kind of sound practices do, do they? These are the questions that I'm asking myself. What kind of sound practices do they do they perform? And then and then going to Jairo Moreno's question, intelligibility intelligibility here is it's the same way that what I, what I sort of started asking, uh, basically uh, you know positioning at the beginning of this presentation this issue that my out that my audience is the audience in some way my friends first and my the, my people first. And then anthropology later in some way, right? Because because what I'm talking about is such a it's such an it's such an internal conversation. Mm -hmm. It's such a mm -hmm. such a, in some ways so, such a close conversation. The people who will listen to it, they will be like, okay, the, I I play I play on the days of Abatala or the days of Shango, I play mm -hmm. Shango music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you walk around Havana, you may not notice it, but people who are in inches, they will know. And there's many in inches in Cuba. Mm -hmm. So th this question, this is where. And at the same time, also in, in, in challenging or in positioning myself as an Afro-Cuban uh, within the practice of anthropology itself, I need to define the, those, the, those, those positions and those coordinates for myself, make sure that I don't lose, my, I, I don't lose track of them, right? Right. Um, so, yeah. I mean, obviously, there's a lot that could be said, but I mean, I, I hope that that makes sense for Heido. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and uh, one last question quickly, which has to do with, uh, also Jairo, which has to do with um, the extent to which you experience this sonic territory that's being taken as masculine, right? Mm. Um, and in the playlist, we're, he we're hearing and sensing a particular kind of masculinity. Mm, and I wonder thank if you, you can talk a little bit more about that. Yes, Especially yes, I'm speaking yes. of um, Nadia Ellis's work on uh, territories of the soul, where mm. she's talking about reclamation of space and how that's mm. such a gendered project. Right. So, so that's a beautiful question. And I am so thankful that you've, you've asked that question because I'll t I think and, and I think that what's lacking in this, this, this playlist is particularly that, that commentary. The playlist was something that happened in the moment in time. And obviously, obviously I'm working on uh, implementing the playlist as something that is this, this, this worker, right? It's, it's sort of work, uh, it's bigger and it's a lot more encompassing. But the question of gender is very important here. Because then, because the thing is that if we if we look at the practices of you know, religious practices in Cuba, for example, which is the main focus, part of the focus of my own work, a lot of the work that is done in terms of who is worshipped, right? It's it's if you think about it, it could be challenging, but mostly female energies are worshipped a lot more. And obviously, there's certain things that I cannot say here, because obviously this is something that has to do with. A particular cause of initiation, but for example, the figure of of um, of of of, of Tanse, the fish in Abaqua, and who who speaks, and the, the figure of the woman within the Abaqua, right, which actually is one of the most important and very very close uh, male male practices, male practice, male uh, male oriented practice societies in, in Cuba, are very very very. Uh, I, I believe there's a, there's an issue here where the, where the the, the, the mother. And, and the woman, the princess, is, is in some way cherished as well. Now, the point that I wanted to make to is that how I approximate or how I get to uh, this point of gender here, and this is why I talk about uh, about the work of um, Padre Henry, is because my discussion of Caliban has to do with the fact that this this nation that I did try to describe, the shape of this nation that I try to describe, uh, this Afro-Cuba that I talk about, I think it's, it's similar to the lack of presence, the absence of Sycorax, right? Mm -hmm. That we have in, in our context, right? So if we go, if we enter the tempest, particularly the issue of the, you know, the hurricane cyclone and how, you know, that, how that describes the disposition of, of, you know, of, of, of the tempest in, in the context of Cuba, we, see, we, we can see how Sycorax becomes very poignant 
and also Pete, you know, uh, Tituba as well, you know, the witch as well. It is another name for the similarly the same thing. How I believe that in some way gender could be, we could begin to, we, we, we can begin to discuss the idea of gender through the figure of Sycorax in her absence. Mm -hmm. So in that same way, the, 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 this allegory or this metaphor of, of a non-existent nation is also, a, a, in some ways, a connection to Sycorax itself, right? Like the fact mm -hmm. that Sycorax does not exist, something that we pray to, something that we, we hope that we can achieve, something that we hope that we can reestablish, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and this is where prophecy becomes so important as well, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, so and orienting the 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 gender dynamic of empire really exactly exactly and then and then obviously i mean it, this could be a bit of cliche but in in a sense i come from a from a household where my mom and my grandmother and my aunts were were central to my life mm -hmm. and are still central to my life mm -hmm. obviously we we can talk about you know martinez martinez uh, alier work mm -hmm. on martin, martin Fogarty in cuba we can talk about Karen Morrison's, you know, the crucible, you know, we can talk about all, but I think it's really important to understand that for Cubans, specifically black people in Cuba, the mother, the figure of the mother, especially through religion, female energy is, is central. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is, this again speaks to this issue of legibility. If you're, if you're not part of the cult, you may, you may require some explanation, but yeah, we, we are right there with it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I feel like we've just only hit the tip of the iceberg, but we did, we did, we did. Our time it's, just, it's just the beginning. Over. It's just the beginning. Yeah, yes. It's just the beginning. And I thank you so much for sharing your Definitely. really wonderful work with us. And thank, thank you, you, everybody in the audience, for joining us this evening. Um, please visit the Center for Africana Studies website <laughs> for a list of future programs and registration information. And if you have any further questions or you want to be in touch with Pablo, feel free to email me or Sean Fields at the Center for Africana Studies and we'll be able to put you in touch. Thank you Thanks so much, Deborah. Again. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you so much, Deborah. And good Thank evening, you. everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.